Meanwhile, in the Smash Tower. And we are looking at the Stereo A Space Weather Beacon as another coronal mass ejection kicks off. Now, we saw this happening yesterday. We called it, and our patrons surely saw the updates. Here we are in public talking about it again. There's the coronal mass ejection. It was forecasted as the plume started to come out. And let's go on to take a look at the sun. It is Earth-facing, by the way, and we'll show you the coronograph from the Lasco C2 momentarily. But first, here's the local yellow dwarf on 193 Axtrams. We've got a series of coronal hole systems connected to the Earth. And here it is in 304 Axtrams. And here's the Lasco C3 I was talking about. If you look right here at the end, you can see a little bit of a halo coming out there at the end, an indication that there is plasma headed our way. It looked pretty high speed to me. And uh, so expect another small coronal mass ejection hit. And I consider all of these dry runs, folks, for when we start getting big coronal mass ejections. And remember, you don't need an x-ray flare to have a coronal mass ejection. Speaking of x-ray flares, we haven't had any for a few days. Although we did have one back on... Uh, yeah, not on the 7th. <laughs> Uh, the last B-class flare, they don't have it listed here for some unknown reason. Anyway, we had a B-class flare a few days ago associated with one of those new sunspots. Here's a real-time solar wind. And we do see a shifting phi angle. The phi angle currently is close to 180 degrees, indicating probable magnetic connection with those coronal holes. Solar wind density quite low, 2.38 protons per cubic centimeter. Solar wind speed down to 396 kilometers a second. And there's the data from ACE. The previous screen was from Discover. And here's the geospace magnetosphere movies. And we'll let that play through. We see a, quite a weak magnetosphere here. As we approach winter, you're going to see the angle on this continue to shift. And the main pressure is in the magnetotail side of the planet. Here are the ground geospace magnetic perturbations. Delta B, changes in the Earth's B field. We do see some pulses coming out of the central Pacific Ocean there around Hawaii, as well as some changes over the Siberian Pole, as well as the Canadian Pole. And we see shifts very far to the west, actually, in Antarctica, as well as some magnetism spilling out of Antarctica into the southern Indian Ocean. No surprises there. And the 10.7 centimeter radio flux has dropped back down to 69 solar flux units. Solar minimum conditions persist, although we're well into cycle 25. Now we see some magnetic pulses here, and it's no surprise once we look at the gong too what's going on there, as there is still a magnetic tug of war going on between the North and South Pole. Which one will be charging your current sheet today? It looks like the North. Anyway, here's the gong two data which will give you a good idea. Keep in mind, this is one hour and five minutes old. And it looks like we are, we have already entered the North Pole oriented portion of the current sheet, shown in green here. We'll let that play through one more time and then show the last frame. And there's the last frame indicating the Earth's magnetic field line has probably already snapped into the green portion here. Again, the North Pole associated portion. South Pole charged portion of the current sheet shown here in red. KP index is at 1. Goes electron flux is at actually fairly low levels there. Nothing to really write home about there. Here's the 
relativistic electrons, the greater than 2 mega electron volt electron flux. And it's slightly high, moderate to high range there. Here's the ionosphere map. And it's six hours of data here are looking quite anomalous, very discharged on the nighttime side. As the solar wind is kind of weak right now. And uh, I'll let that play through real quick and then show the latest frame on that also. You can see the ionosphere discharge up there, or you could say discharge down there when everything turns red in the north. Ionosphere looking a little weak on both the sun and nighttime side. And there's the current image, looking fairly discharged and fairly anomalously homogeneous. Anomalously homogeneous. Last 24 hours of earthquakes included a deep quake at Fiji. This one came in at 11.49 yesterday. 4.2 magnitude quake at 533.3 kilometers. Next we see another Middle Eastern quake, this Iranian quake a 4.4 magnitude. Next we see a 4.1 at Japan, a 4.3 at Afghanistan, a 4.3 at Indonesia, a 4.5 at Nicaragua. As the 7 magnitude earthquake drought continues, do you have an earthquake plan? Are you in an earthquake prone area? Do you know which building facades will fall as you try to evacuate your building, possibly on your head? If you, don't even, if you can't even afford a bug out bag, folks, that counts as prepping. Next, we see a 4.4 at Uzbekistan, this one coming in at 6.15, I'm sorry, at 15.56 UTC. As everybody denotes their times in a different format, folks. Is it Zulu? Is it Universal? Is it Greenwich Mean Time? Well, they're all the same thing. How about a 4.9 at the Solomon Islands? This one's at depth. We just got an earthquake update. 4.6 at Iran. Looks like it's in the same location as that last one. Both of those near the surface. Here's a 4.8 at Nicaragua. And it looks like the largest quake of the past 24 was this 5.7 at the Philippines. Significant uptick there at Philippine quakes, although not particularly large number of quakes at depth. Unlike the Philippines, Western South America is receiving tons of deep quakes over the past months. And that is still my favorite spot for the 7 magnitude earthquake drought to end. This 4.8 at Argentina coming in at 227 kilometers depth. Next to 4.5 at Nicaragua. 57 minutes before midnight UT, we see a 4.8 hitting Japan. Less than an hour later, a 5.0 hits Tonga. Here's a 4.3 at Tajikistan, that one coming in at 112 UT. Here's a 4.6 in the Central Pacific. 4.8 at the Philippines, 4.7 at Indonesia. New Zealand sees a deep quake. That one's a 4.1 magnitude at 174 kilometers. And last on the list of 4 plus magnitudes is this deep in the Asian continent, 4.4 magnitude quake located in Russia. Next, we'll go to windy.com, look at the pressure maps. I'll let it advance about 24 hours from when we shot the video, which was 4.33. I am so not clicking on that. I don't know how it happened. Whatever. <laughs> Anyway, here's where the here's where the pressure will be approximately 24 hours from when we made the video. And moving on to more stuff. Or trying to. Now we talk a lot about doing pole vaults and triple lindies and back handsprings over volcanic calderas. Well, calderas aren't the only thing that's dangerous. Also lava tubes and trimming your trees. Some guy in Hilo, Hawaii was out trimming some trees when he fell 22 feet into a lava tube, which killed him. As Kilauea claims a victim. Links to the article below the video. Volcanic Rundown has a few new entries, and actually one coming back off the list, so let's go down the list. Shivaluch, exploding. 
producing a 12,000 foot ash plume. Mount Abiko, 11,000 foot ash plume there. Mount Aso, 6,000 foot ash plume there. And here's a new one on the list. In the, the Ryukyu Islands, Mount Kikai. And uh, apparently there's been some grayish white plumes rising up to with uh, a thousand meters there. And the number of volcanic earthquakes have been low, but it is erupting a bit. Sakurajima exploded, produced an 11,000 foot ash plume. Sanjiang Api, 10,000 foot ash plume there. Krakatau still erupting. Although it looks like it's calming down a little bit at Krakatau. Mount Takono exploding, 7,000 foot ash plume there. Metis Shoal, uh, reported that by no 1st of November, the eruption has formed an elongated island. So we've got some new real estate near Tonga. The new island is 100 meters wide and 400 meters long and about 120 meters from the former location. And it seems the eruption has ceased, although perhaps don't yet move into that location as there could be some in some continuing activity. Now, in Alaska, Pavlov has been reduced to green normal. Looks like it stopped erupting. Popocatapetl still still exploding, producing a 21,000 foot ash plume. Nevados del Ruiz, possible emissions. Revenador, new emissions observed. Sabancaya, uh, some explosions. Emission of ash and gases going on for months and probably years. Copahue, continuous emissions there, and Nevada State Chilean exploding, producing a 12,000 foot ash plume. And let's keep this thing moving as we don't want the video to be too long. Here's where stuff is in the solar system. There's where it'll be in one week. And here's where it'll be when Mercury transits the sun. And so we've left this article. Until this occurs, here's where the viewing will happen, and we'll get nearly a full view where I am. So get your solar filters out. Here's going to be the path. As Mercury goes very close to the sun's ecliptic, it's going to be an exciting Mercury transit. So check out that article, also again linked below the video. Are you interested in where stuff is above your head? Would you like a would you like a star would you like a star chart? Would you like to use the same star chart that I use? Well, check out in-the-sky.org. Come up here to charts, click on all sky charts, and you put in your location, and I like to draw on the ecliptic. In-the-sky.org, highly recommended. Here's where the lightning is right now. Looks like some heavy lightning in the south of the Aegean Sea there. And let's look at the U.S. Doppler radar map. Now we've got some incredibly cold temperatures predicted for where I'm located. Yesterday morning when I heard the forecast, it was for 11 degrees for the low tonight into tomorrow morning. So Saturday also predicted to be a very cold day with a high temperature only in the low 40s. It's only November 8th and 9th, folks. Apparently, the planet is so hot since you've been emitting so much carbon dioxide. You've been emitting so much carbon dioxide that the planet is so hot that it's become cold. Were you aware that a thermometer is a loop and once it gets really hot, it becomes cold? I, I was not aware. Please leave a comment if you understand how this works in uh, global warming alarmism science. Were you aware that U.S. health care costs were exploding? <laughs> well, probably. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody is fully aware of that. And uh, here's an article from Zero Hedge talking about why. So have yourself a read if you're interested in that. Links to that below the video as well. And here's the U.S. water vapor map. We see some dry air being thrust down into Colorado, Nebraska, and Kansas as a result of some jet stream interactions. And there's going to be some pummeling going on down there. Let me... Uh, show you what I mean. You can already see the compression forming here as this dry air is being pushed. Keep in mind folks, dry air is more massive than moist air. 
and uh, is more in charge of the atmosphere. And everybody pays attention to low pressure systems as low pressure systems are associated with storms and wet weather and so on. Just keep in mind that dry air has greater mass than moist air. I know it seems crazy. You would think all that water is going to be heavier, but that's not the way it works. The molar weight of nitrogen is higher than the molar weight of water in the atmosphere. So, yeah, lots of protons. Anyway, there's going to be some serious compression happening right there, and it's already begun. You can see the bands that are forming there. Something to keep an eye on. And when I say eye on, the pun is intentional. I did notice some heavy turbulence also here uh, associated with the Outer Banks region, as we see. What's going on here is there are uh, probably temperature inversions where we have systems that are at different altitudes, and that's part of the reason why this looks so oddly. Let's look at the cloud layer real quick as a bonus feature. And here's the NASA GOES shortwave. Uh, this is going to give you some indication of where clouds are at nighttime when you can't see them using the visible satellite. Keep in mind, if you use this near the day-night terminator, it will show some errors. And you can see that there are clouds at different altitudes here, and that's why that water vapor map looks so weird. And moving on. Here's the overall cloud scenario. Again, it's the NASA GOES shortwave, this one at 3.9 nanometers is the wavelength. Here's the jet stream of the Western world. Actually, it's two jet streams, one in the north and one in the south, but they're kind of all over the place. And we've got some extreme bends here, 90 degree turns in the northern jet stream, as we've been seeing on the regs. Here are the eastern jets. We see doubled up jet streams, 180 degree turns in the south. And a large anticyclone in the north. Check this one out. Very large anticyclone there over northern Russia. Counterclockwise rotations in the northern hemisphere typically indicate anticyclones, which are actually much more important as far as weather goes than low pressure systems, as anticyclones are high pressure systems. And we've moved on to that is censored and that is a sinkhole where we encourage our viewers to understand the distinction between their you know what and a hole in the ground. First of all, have you pressed like and subscribe on YouTube? Do you enjoy the content? Do you share our content in your social media? We'd be greatly appreciative if you did, as we are as shadow banned as it gets. What about on Instagram? You can't even get to six to 500 followers there. And if you follow us on Instagram, you get great footage like this. What more could you possibly want? Dudes, if you don't have Netflix, you totally got to get Netflix. One of the best Netflix movies ever. It's just a fire that goes on for like an hour. We're also on BitChute. We're on Gab. We're on Minds.com, as we are all over the Internet. But the main source of funding on this channel is Patreon, so please support us there. Thanks to our new gold member patron. Please join at the $9.99 level, folks, as you get very, very limited information at the $1 a month intro level. We were going to get rid of it on Halloween, but we decided to keep it because we didn't want a simple math equation to govern our financial status. I wanted to talk briefly about Voyager 2 again, and I did link to this article. There is one very important thing that I'd like to mention that I forgot to mention yesterday, and it's that Voyager 1 exited the heliosphere six years ago near a solar maximum and did not discover significant differences in either the transition zone or the area outside the heliosphere, at least not of yet. And that is significant, as questions have abounded about whether or not the solar maximum is somehow proportional to something from outside the solar system. I'm still a firm believer in the fact that it is, or in the theory that it is. And let's just say 
we need to trace the sun's Z fields. As Voyager 1 and 2 exited the heliosphere just north and just south of the ecliptic plane, respectively, Voyager 1 went north, Voyager 2 went south, and that's kind of at the front. We need to go to the top and the bottom of the heliosphere as the shape of the heliosphere is still something that's being theorized, although the front portion of it, which what we would call the bow shock in terms of the Earth's magnetosphere, does appear to have a roughly spherically shaped front, and the fields inside the heliosphere seem to align with the fields outside the heliosphere. They're all parallel, and that's probably not a coincidence as that would be one major coincidence. One other thing to note is that as Voyager 2 got to the edge of the heliosphere, it noticed plasma leaking out into intergalactic space. Please leave a comment if you have a theory about any of this as it's cutting edge and interesting. Let's talk about Mambo number 9, actually Mambo 9. It's a massive star-forming galaxy with a very high redshift which astronomers typically, mainstream astronomers typically believe is associated with uh, acceleration away from our galaxy and so on. Now this star-forming galaxy has another catchy name. It's MMJ100026.36 plus 2115. Let me start that over. MMJ100026.36 plus 0215279, better known as Mambo 9. Anyway, it's a good thing, and if you're an Electric Universe nerd, you will appreciate the fact that these galaxies are in close proximity and appear to be interacting in a way that is causing the star formation. And, by the way, these are some massive galaxies. So read about that one. We've linked that below the video as well. Mambo number nine. Hydrogen fluoride emission lines are going to be all over astronomy coming up as some astronomers from, I believe it's Netherlands, have figured out a new way to trace the most common molecule in the universe. Molecular hydrogen, oh yeah. As we estimate the baryonic portion of the universe comprised of approximately 99% molecular hydrogen, it is very difficult to see through spectroscopy. And so, how about a little bit of hydrogen fluoride? Why hydrogen fluoride? Hydrogen fluoride absorbing other radiation, hydrogen fluoride and molecular hydrogen abundance can be linked because hydrogen fluoride is produced in a chemical reaction where molecular hydrogen reacts with atomic fluorine to produce hydrogen fluoride. And atomic hydrogen, without, without molecular hydrogen, there is no hydrogen fluoride. So we're going to be seeing lots of uh, spectroscopy looking for hydrogen fluoride to trace the locations of the molecular hydrogen. It's a good thing. The wavelength is 1.2 terahertz, if you were wondering. And shout out to Umit Kavak, as they've been using their map of HF. So good times there. Another advance in the world of radio astronomy. And we did link to that video also. Were you aware that Democrats completely ran over Republicans in the, in the most recent election. Republican suburban slide shows little sign of slowing. Now here in Pennsylvania, all four seats that were up were all won by Democrats, and at least two Republicans were thrown out of their offices as a result. There were lots of complaints out of Virginia also. We've left links to this Reuter, Reuters article below the video as well. I've got an idea. Read the article. And thanks, Smash Team, we've got a couple bonus segments, so let's go. Now, yesterday we talked about one of the worst, most lame Dungeons & Dragons monsters, the Piercer, a living stalactite, which is edible, by the way. You can even use the oil to make things. I don't know, I don't know who really cares. It's a stalactite. Anyway, let's talk about another monster in D&D, the Doppelganger. That's right. You're walking through the woods. You get separated from your party. This thing shows up, it reads your mind, it dresses up like somebody in your party, and then it tries to kill you and feed off your psychic energy associated with your death. Pretty scary. Why am I talking about that? 
because I've experienced this phenomenon myself. So check out this video, which we've also linked, this one from March 16th, where I talk about my experience. And I've retitled the video. It used to be just called Fireside smash -O chat Now it's called Fireside smash -O chat Doppelganger Wraiths Story. Let me play a clip. After all the leaves had fallen off, and just after some rain, so it was, the skies were still gray, it was very dark, there was very low contrast. Uh, the leaves were all yellow, and they were all on the, on, the, on the forest floor. Anyway, there's a section of woods near where I'm located that I did a lot of today, mountain biking in. To do that. And uh, so anyway, watch the video about the doppelganger and wraiths story as it is an interesting phenomenon. And yes, I can show you on a map where it's located. Here's another D&D monster called the Will-O-Wisp. Another thing that tries to lure you to your death in the woods, this typically happens at nighttime. These things will act like a lantern and then they'll follow, they'll, they'll get you to follow them off of a cliff or something like that. The Will-O-Wisp and the Doppelganger are both monsters that are actually represented in real human folklore. What say you? And we've gone back. We've gone back to the sun again. We've gone back. We do see a little bit of activity right there in the center of the sun. Although we don't see any x-ray flare associated with that. Let's zoom in on that location. Probably a bunch of plasma that popped up and then fell back down onto the chromosphere. Nothing to really worry about there, although there is a coronal mass ejection headed this way. There's the North Pole portion. Here's the South Pole portion. We are out of here, folks. Thanks again for tuning in. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash smashamash. If you want the first updates, become a gold member and help to support the channel. And thanks again, everybody. We are out. Have a delightful day. Don't freeze to death, as there's a hard freeze tonight in a large portion of the country. Get your plants inside, repot stuff, cover stuff up, put up insulation, do whatever you got to do. Stare at the sun, and when you do so, don't drink, and if you drink, stare at the sun anyway, just don't drive. And since it'll never be now again, welcome to the neo-renaissance. May that solar wind be at your back, and that atherosclerosis absent from your veins.